Hello everyone, welcome back to economics class. As you know, because of this lockdown, we were not able to start our classes on time. But because of the department, we are getting this opportunity. So we should be very thankful to the department. Now, in this session, I want to discuss economics with you. So for the newcomers, this is going to be your economics textbook in class 11. See, it's very pretty, and when you open and flip, it's very interesting as well. So if you have not got your copy yet, go out and buy it as early as possible and try to accompany me. So in class 11 economics, we have two parts. One is microeconomics, that's part one, and another part, part two is uh, statistics. However, in this session, I want us to start from the first chapter under microeconomics. So the first chapter under microeconomics will be on introduction. It's very easy. Okay. And then for marks distribution also, the first part will have 50 marks. Then second part, that is statistics, it will have only 40 marks. Another 10 marks will be done in the form of project work. That will be internal. Understood. So uh, we are now starting with the first chapter under microeconomics. Now, in the first chapter, it talks about definition of economics. That's what is written in your textbook, definition of economics. But the condense under that is given as definition of an economy. So please don't get confused with it. I'll discuss with you the meaning of an economy, not economics. Clear or not? In your textbook, it is written definition of economics, but they have explained the meaning of definition of an economy. So we will explain definition of an economy. Now, what is an economy? You just wonder, you just think, and then you just look around. There are people who get job. There are people who work in different parts of the production units and earn a living. Earn a living meaning earning an income. So maybe uh, a farmer will go to his agricultural field, maybe a scientist will go to his research work, a doctor will go to hospital, likewise uh, uh, a banker will go to the bank, so and so forth. There are many areas, there are many institutions and organizations where people go to work and then earn a living. That is simply called an economy. Are you getting the point or not? And therefore, for one mark, what is an economy? An economy is nothing but a system which provides, you have to listen, a system which provides people with a work or with work to earn a living. Getting the point or not? A system which provides the people with work to earn a living is called an economy. Understood? So, Likewise, you know, in India itself also, there are many production units. Some will go to industry, some will go to agricultural field, as I mentioned earlier. Some will go for fishing, some will go for quarry, some will go for, you know, uh, workshops, some will go for construction, manufacturing, some will run hotels, management, insurance companies, so and so forth. There are many ways where an individual work and earn a living. All this technically is called an economy. Are you, are you all getting the point or not? You know, in India, all these production units are categorized into three sectors, primary, secondary, and tertiary sector. So people who work and earn a living, that system is technically called an economy. And therefore, in conclusion also, we can say all those institutions, all those organizations which provides people with a work to earn a living or to earn an income is conventionally called an economy. I'm sure that's clear for one mark or not. If not clear, you please go to your textbook. It becomes easier for us to follow. Next, we want to discuss positive economics and normative economics. Later on, we will discuss microeconomics and macroeconomics, so you have to be attentive. What is positive economics? It's very simple. So, to follow your textbook, analyzing, okay, analyzing economic behavior as they are, you have to listen very carefully, 
analyzing the economic behavior, analyzing the economic situation as they are, without making any value judgment, whether the situation is good or bad, that does not bother positive economics. Analyzing the economic behavior as they are, without making any value judgment, whether the outcome is good or bad, is technically called positive economics. Likewise, analyzing economic behavior as they ought to be, it should be like this or like that, meaning analyzing economic behavior as they ought to be, and also at the same time making value judgment, whether the decision is good or bad, whether the situation is good or bad, making such value judgment, that is technically called normative economics. Are you able to differentiate between the two or not? In positive economics, uh, the, the followers of positive economics will just analyze the situation, all right? But they will not make any value judgment. They are neutral, they remain silent. They just watch the situation and then that's the end of the story. Getting the point or not? So there is one very renowned economist by the name Professor Rubins. Okay, so when you go to higher classes, you will come across these names very often. In, 11, in class 11, they have mentioned just once, but that's important. That's the reason I'm mentioning it. So even Professor Rubins also advocated that economics is purely positive science. All right, to some economics could be uh, normative economics. To some, economics might be different, but to Professor Rubin's, economics is purely a positive science. Getting the point or not? So, one very good example of positive economics is one statement. India is overpopulated. That's the statement. They are not making a new value judgment or they are not asking us the reason whether uh, I mean, as to why population is large, why it is overpopulated, or, or what must be done in order to control population. Nothing such like is mentioned. It's, it just says, okay, India is overpopulated. That's, that's a term for positive economics. Another one is, uh, prices in India has been rising. That's it. They just mentioned prices has been rising in India. They did not mention how it rose. They did not mention what should be done to control. No, nothing like that. So in positive economics, no value judgment is made. You have to be very careful with that. No value judgment is made and we observe the economic situation as they are. So you have to mention this when you write as they are. And Professor Robbins also advocated that economics is purely positive science that you have to remember. Then normative economics, as I was telling you earlier, it analyzes, it analyzes the economic behavior as they ought to be. All right. And at the same time, by making value judgment, whether the situation is good or bad, getting the point or not. So uh, there is also another economist by the name Marshall. All right. When you go to higher classes, Marshall will, will you know, give you trouble also because he has given so many theories and, uh, you know, we go through all those. So Marshall, he advocated that economics is purely a normative science. So to him, it's a normative science, but again, to Professor Rubin's economics is positive science, so and so forth, so many. It all depends on how you support your statement. Now, one very good example of normative economics is, to follow your textbook, it says, Rich people should be taxed more. Are you listening or not? Rich people should be taxed more. So in this statement, if you listen carefully, if you observe carefully, some judgment has been done or not. Some value judgment is done. Rich people should be taxed more. Why? Because when rich people, when rich people are taxed more, those taxation money will be used for the welfare of the poor people. Government is trying to bring equality. Government is trying to bridge the gap between the rich and the poor. Value judgment is made here. Rich people should be taxed more or not. Another statement is poor students or, 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 or poor people uh, should be given free and compulsory education. Getting the point or not? 
poor people in the rural areas should be given free and compulsory education. If you listen very carefully, some value judgment is made there or not. Poor people are not able to afford private schools. Poor people are not able to afford all those, uh, all those uh, expensive schools. And therefore, if government does not do anything, it's always a trouble. And therefore, now the statement says they should be given free and compulsory education or not. And when that is done, you know, it will bring some changes in the economy. And of, and, and of course, we are doing this even in the present situation as well. Not everybody can afford private schools. Private schools, they're already running their own online classes. But for mainly government-run schools, we are doing this. So value judgment is made there, getting the point or not. So that's the difference between positive economics and normative economics. Value judgment is met in normative economics and they observe the economic situation as they ought to be. In positive economics, they study the eco economy as they are. No value judgment is met. They remain neutral. That's the point. Then we have the difference between microeconomics and macroeconomics. In, uh, in my previous video, we have already discussed in detail the meaning of macroeconomics because this is already there in class 12. But now, we have the difference between these two, even here in class 11 as well. So what is microeconomics? You might want to refer your textbook. It says uh, it's a branch of economic theory, the branch of economic theory which studies, you have to listen carefully, the branch of economic theory which studies the behavior of individual economic units. Listen very carefully. The branch of economic theory which studies the behavior of the individual economic units. So individual economic units like a particular household or maybe a particular industry or maybe a particular uh, consumer or maybe a particular firm. Are you all getting the point or not? In microeconomics, we don't study the situation in general. We pick and we study a particular individual economic unit. So that's the reason it says the branch of economic theory which studies the behavior of individual economic units such as individual household, individual firm, individual consumer, individual industry, so and so forth. In micro, we talk about minor, small, small things. However, in macroeconomics, it's totally different. The branch of economic theory which studies the economy in general. The branch of economic study, uh, the branch of economic theory which studies the economy in its totality or as a whole, that simply is called macroeconomics. Macro means large. We emphasize on the general body and therefore some such like example will be poverty. Poverty is a social phenomena which affects the people no food, no clothing, no shelter. So when we study poverty, we do not only talk about a particular area. We say poverty and it's for the entire nation, India. That's why we say India has large percentage of poverty or not. Likewise, when we say population, we don't only talk about a particular household. We don't only talk about a particular locality. When we say population, it includes all the people in the country. That's why population is also a macroeconomic study or not. Unemployment is one. National income is one. You know, there are many examples which we can cite, but there is a shortage of time. So I'm just winding up there. So in macroeconomics, uh, it studies the situation in its totality as a whole. In micro, we study the behavior uh, of the individual economic units. Clear or not? That's very easy, right? So for one mark, they'll ask, so you have to listen carefully. Then we have factors of production. This is very important. You are taking up economics, and if you do not know the meaning of factors of production, you will be a laughing stock in the society. So don't do that. Understood? What is factors of production? It refers to, or, or it, is the, it is the input. It is the required inputs, or it is the required resources which is needed for the 
production of goods and services in the economy. Are you all following or not? Factors of production, it is the required inputs or resources which is needed for the production of goods and services in the economy. And what are the resources? These are the resources. Land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. A production unit will use all of these to produce a single commodity. Are you all listening or not? What is land? In general, when we say land, it means the plot of land that we see or maybe the soil that we are able to see. That's what we normally think in general. But in economics, when we say land, it includes all gifts of nature. All right, technically called natural resources. So it will include all those subsoil assets like diamond, gold, silver that we get from underneath the earth. Or it will also include oceans, rivers, seas, trees, mountains, so and so forth. That includes land, labor, meaning it's you and I. We work mentally and physically for the production of good. That is labor. Capital. Capital means man-made asset. All these things that you look around, these are man-made asset. The board, the mic, the, the camera, the TV set, all these are man-made or not. So tools and implements, machineries, all these will come under capital. And then most important part is entrepreneurship. There has to be someone who should be able to take risk, undertake risk in initiating a production unit in trying to manage all these, all these resources. Even if you have all these, if you don't have the managerial skill and ability, you will not be able to run your industry. So manager or entrepreneur is the one who undertakes risk to organize all these factors and engage in the production of goods and services. So every production you need will want to make sure that all these resources are utilized in the production of goods and services. Once again, factors of production is the required inputs or resources which is needed for the production of goods and services in the economy. All these resources will be comprised of land, labor, capital and entrepreneurship. Land, it includes all gifts of nature technically called natural resources. It will include all those subsoil assets. It will include all those things which we get from river, ocean, sea, petroleum products, so and so forth. There are many labor, the mental ability, the physical ability that we use to earn a living, then capital, man-made assets, and then finally entrepreneurship. And entrepreneur is the manager who organizes all these production activities, who undertakes risk in organizing these and you know go for production activities. That's why or that's how production activities activities is done. That's how people get a job. That's how people get to earn a living. And all this is technically called an economy. Because we say it, an economy is a system which provides people with, with the means to work and earn a living or not. So whatever that we have already discussed here, we'll come back to the origin point, definition of an economy. Clear or not? So with this, I wind up my session for today. In the next session, we will discuss chapter 2. And chapter 2 says... Uh, central problems of an economy. It's very easy. If you have your textbook, you please go through once before I come and meet you because if you do that, it becomes easier for you to follow. Thank you.